Testament of Job Chapter 1 The Book of the Words of Job, the one called Jobab Now on the day when, having fallen ill, he began to settle his affairs, he called his seven sons and his three daughters, whose names are Tersi, Choros, Hyon, Nike, Phoros, Fife, Fruon, Hamera, Cassia, and Amathia's horn. And when he had called his children, he said, Gather round my children, gather round me so that I may show you the things which the Most High did with me and all the things which have happened to me. I am your father Job, fully engaged in endurance. But you are a chosen and honored race from the seed of Jacob, the father of your mother. For I am from the sons of Esau, the brother of Jacob, of whom is your mother Dinah, from whom I begot you. My former wife died with the other ten children in a bitter death. So hear me, children, and I will show you the things which have befallen me. Job's Perplexity Over Idolatry Chapter 2 Now I used to be Jobab before the Most High named me Job. When I was called Jobab, I lived quite near a venerated idol's temple. As I constantly saw whole burnt offerings being offered up there, I began reasoning within myself, saying, Is this really the God who made heaven and earth, the sea too, and our very selves? How shall I know? Chapter 3 One night as I was in bed, a loud voice came to me in a very bright light, saying, Jobab, Jobab. And I said, Yes, here I am. And he said, Arise, and I will show you who this is whom you wish to know. This one whose whole burnt offerings they bring, and whose drink offerings they pour, is not God. Rather, his is the power of the devil by whom human nature is deceived. When I heard these things, I fell on my bed worshiping and saying, My Lord, who came for the salvation of my soul, I beg you, if this is indeed the place of Satan, by whom men are deceived, grant me authority to go and purge his place so that I may put an end to the drink offerings being poured for him. Who is there to forbid me since I rule this region? The Angel's Disclosure of Impending Calamities, Chapter 4 The light answered me and said, You shall be able to purge this place, but I am going to show you all the things which the Most High charged me to tell you. And I said, Whatever he has charged me, his servant, I will hear and do. Again he said, Thus says the Most High, If you attempt to purge the place of Satan, he will rise up against you with wrath for battle but he will be unable to bring death upon you. He will bring on you many plagues. He will take away for himself your goods. He will carry off your children. But if you are patient, I will make your name renowned in all generations of the earth to the consummation of the age. And I will return you again to your goods. It will be repaid to you doubly, so you may know that the Most High is impartial rendering good things to each one who obeys and you shall be raised up in the resurrection for you will be like a sparing athlete both enduring pains and winning the crown then will you know that the most high is just true and strong giving strength to his elect ones job's destruction of the idol's shrine chapter 5 and I, my little children, replied to him, Till death I will endure, I will not step back at all. After I had been sealed by the angel when he left me, my little children, then, having arisen the next night, I took fifty youths with me, struck off for the temple of the idol, and leveled it to the ground. And so I withdrew into my house, having ordered the doors to be secured. 
Satan's attack and Job's tragedy. Satan disguised as a beggar. Chapter 6. Listen, little children, and marvel. For as soon as I entered into my house and secured my doors, I charged my doormen thus. If anyone should seek me today, give no report, but say, He has no time, for he is inside concerned with an urgent matter. So while I was inside, Satan knocked at the door, having disguised himself as a beggar. And he said to the doormaid, Tell Job I wish to meet with him. When the doormaid came and told me these things, she heard me say to report that I had no time just now. Chapter 7 When he heard that, Satan departed and put a yoke on his shoulders. And when he arrived, he spoke to the doormaid, saying, Say to Job, Give me a loaf of bread from your hand so I may eat. So I gave a burnt loaf of bread to the girl to give to him and said to him, Expect to eat my loaves no longer, for you are estranged from me. Then the doormaid, ashamed to give him the burnt and ashen loaves of bread, for she did not know he was Satan, took the good loaf of her own and gave it to him. And when he received it and knew what had occurred, he said to the girl, Off with you, evil servant. Bring the loaf of bread given you to be given to me. The girl wept with deep grief, saying, Truly you will say, I am an evil servant, for if I were not, I would have done just as it was assigned to me by my master. And when she returned, she brought him the burnt loaf of bread, saying to him, Thus says my Lord, You shall no longer eat from my loaves at all, for I have been estranged from you. Yet I have given you this loaf of bread in order that I might not be accused of providing nothing to a begging enemy. When he heard these things, Satan sent the girl back to me, saying, As this loaf of bread is wholly burnt, so shall I do to your body also, for within the hour I will depart and devastate you. And I replied to him, Do what you will, for if you intend to bring anything on me, I am prepared to undergo whatever you inflict. Satan implores the Most High for power over Job. Chapter 8 After he withdrew from me, when he had gone out under the firmament, he implored the Most High that he might receive authority over my goods. And then, when he had received the authority, he came and took away all my wealth. Job's Generosity and Piety his philanthropy. Chapter 9 So listen, for I will show you all the things which have befallen me, my losses. For I used to have a hundred and thirty thousand sheep. Of them I designated seven thousand to be sheared for the clothing of orphans and widows, the poor and the helpless. And I had a pack of eighty dogs guarding my flocks. I also had two hundred other dogs guarding the house. And I used to have 9,000 camels. From them I chose 3,000 to work in every city. After I loaded them with good things, I sent them away into the cities and villages, charging them to go and distribute to the helpless, to the destitute, and to all the widows. And I used to have 140,000 grazing she-asses. From these I marked off 500 and gave a standing order for their offspring to be sold and given to the poor and needy. From all regions people began coming to me for a meeting. The four doors of my house stood open, and I gave a standing order to my house servants that these doors should stand open, having this in view. Possibly some would come asking alms, and because they might see me sitting at the door, would turn back ashamed, getting nothing. Instead, whenever they would see me sitting at one door, they could leave through another and take as much as they needed. His Hospitality Chapter 10 And I established in my house thirty tables spread at all hours for strangers only. I also used to maintain twelve other tables set for the widows. When any stranger approached to ask alms, 
he was required to be fed at my table before he would receive his need. Neither did I allow anyone to go out of my door with an empty pocket. I used to have 3,500 yoke of oxen, and I chose from them 500 yoke and designated them for plowing, which they could do in any field of those who would use them. And I marked off their produce for the poor for their table. I also used to have 50 bakeries from which I arranged for the ministry of the table for the poor. His Underwritten Charities Chapter 11 There were also certain strangers who saw my eagerness, and they too desired to assist in this service. And there were still others at the time without resources and unable to invest a thing, who came and entreated me, saying, We beg you, may we also engage in this service. We own nothing, however, show mercy on us and lend us money, so we may leave for distant cities on business and be able to do this poor a service. And afterward we shall repay you what is yours. When I heard these things, I would rejoice that they would take anything at all from me for the care of the poor. And receiving their note eagerly, I would give them as much as they wished, taking no security from them except a written note, so they would go out at my expense. Sometimes they would succeed in business and give to the poor, but at other times they would be robbed, and they would come and entreat me, saying, We beg you, be patient with us. Let us find how we might be able to repay you. Without delay, I would bring before them the note and read it granting cancellation as the crowning feature and saying, since I trusted you for the benefit of the poor, I will take nothing back from you, nor would I take anything from my debtor. Chapter 12 On occasion a man cheerful at heart would come to me saying, I am not wealthy enough to help the destitute, yet I wish to serve the poor today at your table. When it was agreed he would serve and eat, at evening, as he was about to leave for home, he would be compelled to take wages from me, as I would say, I know you are a working man, counting on and looking for your wages. You must accept. Nor did I allow the wage earners pay to remain at home with me in my house. His Fabulous Wealth in Cattle, The Buttered Mountains, Chapter 13 Those who milked the cows grew weary, since milk flowed in the mountains, Butter spread over my roads, and from its abundance my herds bedded down in the rocks and mountains because of the births. So the mountains were washed over with milk and became as congealed butter, and my servants, who prepared the meals for the widows and the poor, grew tired and would curse me in contempt, saying, Who will give us some of his meat cuts to be satisfied? Nevertheless, I was quite kind." His Musical Prowess, Chapter 14 And I used to have six psalms in a ten-string lyre. I would rouse myself daily after the feeding of the widows, take the lyre, and play for them, and they would chant hymns. And with the psaltery I would remind them of the Most High so that they might glorify the Most High. If my maid servants ever began murmuring, I would take up the psaltery and strum as payment in return and thus I would make them stop murmuring in contempt. His Familial Piety, Chapter 15 After the ministry of the service, my children daily took their supper. They went into their older brother to dine with him, taking along with them their three sisters also. The urgent matters were left with the maid servants, since my sons also sat at table with the male slaves who served. I therefore early would offer up sacrifices on their behalf according to their number, 300 doves, 50 goats, kids, and 12 sheep. I issued a standing order for all that remained after the rights to be furnished to the poor, and I would say to them, Take these things remaining after the rights so that you may pray on behalf of my children. 
Possibly my sons may have sinned before the Most High through boasting by saying with disdain, We are the sons of this rich man, and these goods are ours. Why then do we also serve? For pride is an abomination before the Most High. And again I offered up a select calf on the altar of the Most High, lest my sons may have thought evil things in their heart toward the Most High. Job's Losses His Cattle, Chapter 16 As I was doing these things during the seven years after the angel had made the disclosure to me, then Satan, when he had received the authority, came down unmercifully and torched seven thousand sheep, which had been designated for the clothing of the widows, the three thousand camels and the five hundred she-asses, and the five hundred yoke of oxen. All these he destroyed by himself according to the authority he had received against me. The rest of my herds were confiscated by my fellow countrymen, who had been well treated by me, but who now rose up against me and took away the remainder of my animals. They reported to me the destruction of my goods, but I glorified the Most High and did not blaspheme. His Children Chapter 17 Then the devil, when he had come to know my heart, laid a plot against me. Disguising himself as the king of the Persians, he stood in my city gathering together all the rogues in it. And with a boast he spoke to them, saying, This man Jobab is the one who destroyed all the goods of the earth and left nothing, the one who distributed to the beggars, to the blind, and to the lame, yet the one who destroyed the temple of the great God and leveled the place of drink offerings. Therefore I also shall repay him according to what he did against the house of God. Come along then and gather spoils for yourselves of all his animals and whatever he has left on the earth. They answered him and said, He has seven sons and three daughters. Possibly they might flee to the other lands and plead against us as though we were tyrants and in the end rise against us and kill us. So he said to them, Have no fear at all. Most of his possessions I have already destroyed by fire, the others I have confiscated, and as for his children, I shall slay them. Chapter 18 When he said these things to them, he departed and smashed the house down upon my children and killed them. My fellow countrymen, when they saw that what was said truly happened, pursued and attacked me and began to snatch up everything in my house. My eyes witnessed cheap and worthless men at my tables and couches. I was unable to utter a thing, for I was exhausted, as a woman numbed in her pelvic region by the magnitude of birth pangs. Remembering most of all the battle foretold by the Most High through his angel, and the songs of victory which had been told to me, and I became as one wishing to enter a certain city to discover its wealth and gain a portion of its splendor and as one embarked with cargo in a sea-going ship. Seeing at mid-ocean the third wave and the opposition of the wind, he threw the cargo into the sea, saying, I am willing to lose everything in order to enter this city, so that I might gain both the ship and things better than the payload. Thus I also considered my goods as nothing compared to the city about which the angel spoke to me. Chapter 19 When the final messenger came and showed me the loss of my children, I was deeply disturbed. I tore my garment, saying to the one who brought the report, How were you spared? And then when I understood what had happened, I cried aloud, saying, The Most High gave, the Most High took away. As it seemed good to the Most High, so it has happened. Blessed be the name of the Most High. His Health, Chapter 20 So when all my goods were gone, Satan concluded that he was unable to provoke me to contempt. When he left, he asked my body from the Most High, so he might inflict the plague on me. Then the Most High gave me over into his hands to be used as he wished with respect to the body, but he did not give him authority over my soul. 
Then he came to me while I was sitting on my throne, mourning the loss of my children. And he became like a great whirlwind and overturned my throne. For three hours I was beneath my throne, unable to escape. And he struck me with a severe plague from head to toe. In great trouble and distress, I left the city, and I sat on a dung heap, worm-ridden in body. Discharges from my body wet the ground with moisture. Many worms were in my body, and if a worm ever sprang off, I would take it up and return it to its original place, saying, Stay in the same place where you were put until you are directed otherwise by your commander. His Wife, Chapter 21 I spent forty-eight years on the dung heap outside the city, under the plague, so that I saw with my own eyes my children, my first wife carrying water into the house of a certain nobleman as a maidservant, so she might get bread and bring it to me. I was stunned, and I said, The God of these city fathers, how can they treat my wife like a female slave? After this I regained my senses. Chapter 22 After eleven years they kept even bread itself from me, barely allowing her to have her own food. And as she did get it, she would divide it between herself and me, saying with pain, Woe is me, soon he will not even get enough bread. She would not hesitate to go out into the market to beg bread from the bread sellers, so she might bring it to me so I could eat. Chapter 23 When Satan knew this, he disguised himself as a bread seller. It happened by chance that my wife went to him and begged bread, thinking he was a man. And Satan said to her, Pay the price and take what you like. But she answered him and said, Where would I get money? Are you unaware of the evils that have befallen us? If you have any pity on me, show mercy. But if not, you shall see. And he answered her, saying, Unless you deserve the evils, you would not have received them in return. Now then, if you have no money at hand, offer me the hair of your head, and take three loaves of bread. Perhaps you will be able to live for three more days. Then she said to herself, What good is the hair of my head compared to my hungry husband? And so, showing disdain for her hair, she said to him, Go ahead, take it. Then he took scissors, sheared off the hair of her head, and gave her three loaves, while all were looking on. When she got the loaves, she came and brought them to me. Satan followed her along the road, walking stealthily and leading her heart astray. Chapter 24 At once my wife drew near, crying out with tears, she said to me, Job, Job, how long will you sit on the dung heap outside the city, thinking, only a little longer, and awaiting the hope of your salvation? As for me, I am a vagabond and a maidservant going round from place to place. Your memorial has been wiped away from the earth. My sons and the daughters of my womb, for whom I toiled with hardships in vain, and here you sit in worm-infested rottenness passing the night in the open air, and I for my part am a wretch immersed in labor by day and in pain by night, just so I might provide a loaf of bread and bring it to you. Any more I barely receive my own food, and I divide that between you and me, wondering in my heart that it is not bad enough for you to be ill, but neither do you get your fill of bread." So I ventured unashamedly to go into the market, even if I was pierced in my heart to do so. And the bread seller said, Give money, and you shall receive. But I also showed him our straits, and then heard from him, If you have no money, woman, pay with the hair of your head, and take three loaves. Perhaps you will live for three more days. Being remiss, I said to him, Go ahead, cut my hair. So he arose and cut my hair disgracefully in the market while the crowd stood by and marveled. Chapter 25 Who is not amazed that this is Cities, the wife of Job, who used to have fourteen draperies sheltering her chamber, 
and a door within doors so that one was considered quite worthy merely to gain admission to her presence. Now she exchanges her hair for loaves, whose camels loaded with good things used to go off into the regions of the poor. Now she gives her hair in return for loaves. Look at her who used to keep seven tables reserved at her house, at which the poor and alien used to eat. Now she sells outright her hair for loaves. See one who used to have a foot basin of gold and silver, and now she goes along by foot. Even her hair she gives in exchange for loaves. Observe, this is she who used to have clothing woven from the linen with gold, but now she bears rags and gives her hair in exchange for loaves. See her who used to own couches of gold and silver, but now she sells her hair for loaves. Job, Job, although many things have been said in general, I speak to you in brief. In the weakness of my heart, my bones are crushed. Rise, take the loaves, be satisfied, and then speak some word against the Most High and die. Then I too shall be freed from weariness that issues from the pain of your body. Chapter 26 So I answered her, Look, I have lived seventeen years in these plagues, submitting to the worms in my body, and my soul has never been depressed by my pains so much as by your statement. Speak some word against the Most High and die? I do indeed suffer these things, and you suffer them too, the loss both of our children and our goods. Do you suggest that we should say something against the Most High, and thus be alienated from the truly great wealth? Why have you not remembered those many good things we used to have? If we have received good things from the hand of the Most High, should we not in turn endure evil things? Rather, let us be patient till the Most High, in pity, show us mercy. Do you not see the devil standing behind you and unsettling your reasoning, so that he might deceive me too? For he seeks to make an exhibit of you as one of the senseless women who misguide their husband's sincerity. Job's Triumph and Satan's Defeat Again turning to Satan who was behind my wife, I said, Come up front, stop hiding yourself. Does a lion show his strength in a cage? Does a fledgling take flight when it is in a basket? Come out and fight. Then he came out from behind my wife, and as he stood, he wept, saying, Look, Job, I am weary, and I withdraw from you, even though you are flesh and I a spirit. You suffer a plague, but I am in deep distress. I became like one athlete wrestling another, and one pinned the other. The upper one silenced the lower one by filling his mouth with sand and bruising his limbs. But because he showed endurance and did not grow weary, at the end the upper one cried out in defeat. So you also, Job, were the one below and in a plague, but you conquered my wrestling tactics, which I brought on you. Then Satan, ashamed, left me for three years. Now then, my children, you also must be patient in everything that happens to you, for patience is better than anything." Job Recognized and the Kings Astonished Chapter 28 After I had spent twenty years under the plague, the kings also heard about what happened to me. They arose and came to me, each from his own country, so that they might encourage me by a visit. But as they approached from a distance, they did not recognize me, and they cried out and wept, tearing their garments and throwing dust. They sat beside me for seven days and nights, and not one of them spoke to me. It was not due to their patience that they were silent, but because they knew me before these evils when I lived in lavish wealth. For when I used to bring out for them the precious stones, they would marvel, clapping their hands, and say, If the goods of our three kingdoms were gathered into one at the same place, they would be no equal to the glorious stones of your kingdom, for I was more noble than those from the east. But when they came to Ossites, asking in the city, Where is Jobab, the king of all Egypt? 
they said to them about me, he sits on a dung heap outside the city. For twenty years he has not returned to the city. Then they asked about my goods and the things which had befallen me were shown to them. Chapter 29 When they heard that, they left the city together with the citizens, and my fellow citizens showed me to them. But they remonstrated, saying I was not Jobab. Since they were still quite in doubt, Eliphaz, the king of the Timonites, turned to me and said, Are you Jobab, our fellow king? And I wept, shaking my head and throwing dust on it, and I said to them, I am indeed. Chapter 30 When they saw me shaking my head, they dropped to the ground in a faint, and their troops were disturbed at seeing the three kings collapsed on the ground as if dead for three hours. Then they arose and began saying to one another, We do not believe that this is he. Then they sat for seven days reviewing my affairs, recalling my herds and goods, and saying, Have we not known about the many good things sent out by him into the cities and the surrounding villages to be distributed to the poor, besides those established at his house? How then has he now fallen into such a deathly state? Eliphaz laments Job's losses. Chapter 31 And after seven days of such considerations, Eliphaz spoke up and said to his fellow kings, Let us approach him and question him carefully, to see if it is really he himself or not. But since they were about a half stadium distant from me, because of the stench of my body, they arose and approached me with perfumes in their hands while their soldiers accompanied them, scattering incense around me so they would be able to approach me. And they spent three days furnishing the incense. And when they had come near me, Eliphaz spoke up and said to me, Are you Jobab, our fellow king? Are you the one who once had vast splendor? Are you the one who was like the sun by day in all the land? Are you the one who was like the moon and the stars that shine at midnight? And I said to him, I am indeed. And so after he had wept with a loud wailing, he called out a royal lament while both the other kings and their troops sang in response. Chapter 32 Hear then the lament of Eliphaz as he celebrates for all the wealth of Job. Are you the one who appointed seven thousand sheep for the clothing of the poor? Where then is the splendor of your throne? Are you the one who appointed three thousand camels for the transport of goods to the needy? Where then is the splendor of your throne? Are you the one who appointed the thousand cattle for the needy to use when plowing? Where then is the splendor of your throne? Are you the one who had golden couches but now sits on a dung heap? Now where is the splendor of your throne? Who opposed you when you were in the midst of your children, for you were blooming as a sprout of a fragrant fruit tree? Now where is the splendor of your throne? Are you the one who established the sixty tables set for the poor? Now where is the splendor of your throne? Are you the one who had the censers of the fragrant assembly? Now you live amid a foul stench. Are you the one who had golden lamps on silver stands, but now you await the light of the moon? Where then is the splendor of your throne? Are you the one who had the ointment of frankincense, but now you are in straits? Where then is the splendor of your throne? Are you the one who jeered at the unjust and the sinners, but now you too have become a joke? Now where is the splendor of your throne? Are you Job, the one who had vast splendor? Now where is the splendor of your throne? Chapter 33 after Eliphaz finished wailing while his fellow kings responded to him all in a great commotion, when the uproar died down, I said to them, Quiet, now I will show you my throne with the splendor of its majesty, which is among the holy ones. My throne is in the upper world, and its splendor and majesty come from the right hand of the Father. The whole world shall pass away, and its splendor shall fade, and those who heed it shall share in its overthrow. But my throne is in the Holy Land, and its splendor is in the world of the Changeless One.
Rivers will dry up and the arrogance of their waves goes down into the depths of the abyss. But the rivers of my land where my throne is do not dry up, nor will they disappear, but they will exist forever. These kings will pass away and rulers come and go, but their splendor and bow shall be as in a mirror. But my kingdom is forever and ever, and its splendor and majesty are in the chariots of the Father. Chapter 34 as I was saying these things to them so they would be quiet, Eliphaz became enraged and said to the other friends, What good has it done that we have come here with our armies to comfort him? Look, now he accuses us. Let us then go back to our own countries. Here he sits in the misery of worms and foul odors, and yet he is piqued at us. Kingdoms pass away and so do their sovereigns. But as for my kingdom, he says, it shall last forever. So Eliphaz, arising with great consternation, turned away from them in deep sadness and said, I am leaving. We came to cheer him, and yet he demeans us in the presence of our troops. Baldad tests Job's sanity. Chapter 35 Then Baldad seized him and said, one should not speak that way to a man who not only is in mourning, but also is beset by many plagues. Take note, although we are quite healthy, we were not strong enough to approach him because of the foul stench, except by the use of much perfume. You there, Eliphaz, do you forget how you were when you fell ill for two days? Now then, let us be patient in order that we may discover his true condition. Perhaps he is emotionally disturbed. Perhaps he recalls his former prosperity and has become mentally deranged. For who would not be driven senseless and imbalanced when he is sick? But allow me to approach him and I will determine his condition. Chapter 36 Then Beldad, when he had arised, approached me and said, Are you Job? And I said to him, Yes. And he said, Is your heart troubled? And I said to him, My heart is not fixed on earthly concerns, since the earth and those who dwell in it are unstable. But my heart is fixed on heavenly concerns, for there is no upset in heaven. And Baldad replied and said, We know the earth is unstable, since of course it changes from time to time. Since it steers an even course and is at peace, there are also times of war. But as for heaven, we hear that it stays calm. But if you are truly sound of mind, I will ask you about something. And if you answer me sensibly regarding the first query, I will ask you about a second matter. And if you answer me calmly, it will be clear that you are not emotionally disturbed. Chapter 37 so he said, In whom do you hope? And I said, In the God who lives. And again he said to me, Who destroyed your goods or inflicted you with these plagues? And I said, God. And again he replied and said, Do you hope upon God? Then how do you reckon him to be unfair by inflicting you with all these plagues or destroying your goods? If he were to give and then take away, it would actually be better for him not to have given anything. At no time does a king dishonor his own soldier who bears arms well for him, or will he ever understand the deep things of the Lord and his wisdom? Who dares to ascribe to the Lord an injustice? Answer me this, Job. And again I say to you, if you are sound of mind and have your wits about you, tell me why we see the sun on the one hand rising in the east and setting in the west. And again, when we get up early, we find it rising again in the east. Explain these things to me if you are the servant of the Most High. Chapter 38 And to all this I said, I do not have my wits about me and my mind is sound. Why then should I not speak out the magnificent things of the Most High? Or should my mouth utterly blunder regarding the master? Never. Who are we to be busying ourselves with heavenly matters, seeing that we are fleshly, having our lot in dust and ashes? Now then, 
so you may know that my heart is sound, here's my question for you. Food enters the mouth, then water is drunk through the same mouth and sent into the same throat. But whenever the two reach the latrine, they are separated from each other. Who divides them? And Baldad said, I do not know. Again I replied and said to him, If you do not understand the functions of the body, how can you understand heavenly matters? So far offers the royal physicians. Then so far replied and said, We are not inquiring after things beyond us, but we have sought to know if you are of sound mind, and now we truly know that your intelligence has been unaffected. What then do you wish us to do for you? Look, since we are traveling, we have brought along with us the physicians of our three kingdoms. Do you wish to be treated by them? Perhaps you will find relief. But I answered and said, My healing and my treatment are from the Most High, who also created the physicians. Cities laments her children dies and is buried. Chapter 39 While I was saying these things to them, my wife's cities arrived in tattered garments. Fleeing from the servitude of the official she served, since he had forbidden her to leave lest the fellow kings see her and seize her. When she came, she threw herself at their feet and said, weeping, Do you remember me, Eliphaz, you and your two friends? Who sort of person I used to be among you and how I used to dress? But now look at my debut and my attire. Then when they had made a great lamentation and were doubly exhausted, they fell silent, so that Eliphaz seized his purple robe, tore it off, and threw it about my wife. But she began to beg them, saying, I plead with you, order your soldiers to dig through the ruins of the house that fell on my children, so that at least their bones might be preserved as a memorial, since we cannot because of the expense. Let us see them, even if it is only their bones." Have I the womb of cattle or of a wild animal that my ten children have died and I have not arranged the burial of a single one of them? And they left to dig, but I forbade it, saying, Do not trouble yourselves in vain, for you will not find my children, since they were taken up into heaven by the Creator, their King. Then again they answered me and said, Who then will not say you are demented and mad when you say, My children have been taken up into heaven? Tell us the truth now. Chapter 40 And I replied to them and said, Lift me up so I can stand erect. And they lifted me up, supporting my arms on each side. And then when I had stood up, I sang praises to the Father. And after the prayer, I said to them, Look up with your eyes to the east and see my children crowned with the splendor of the heavenly one. And when she saw that, cities my wife fell to the ground worshiping and said, Now I know that I have a memorial with the Lord, so I shall arise and return to the city and nap a while and then refresh myself before the duties of my servitude. And when she left for the city, she went to the cow shed of her oxen, which had been confiscated by the rulers whom she served. And she lay down near a certain manger and died in good spirits. When her domineering ruler sought her but could not find her, he went when it was evening into the folds of the herds and found her sprawled out dead. And all who saw cried out in an uproar of lament over her, and the sound reached through the whole city. When they rushed in to discover what had happened, they found her dead and the living animals standing about weeping over her. And so bearing her in procession, they attended to her burial, locating her near the house that had collapsed on her children. And the poor of the city made a great lamentation, saying, Look, this is Cities, the woman of pride and splendor. She was not even considered worthy of a decent burial. So then you will find in the miscellanies the lament made for her. Job's Recovery and Vindication Chapter 41 Eliphaz and the rest sat beside me after these things, arguing and talking big against me. 
after 27 days, they were about to rise and go to their own countries when they were implored by Elihu saying, stay here till I clarify this issue for him. You held on quite some time while Job boasted himself to be a just man, but I will not hold on. From the start, I too made lamentation for him, remembering his former prosperity. And here now he speaks out in boastful grandeur, saying he has his throne in heaven. Listen to me now, and I will tell you about his imaginary estate. Then Elihu, inspired by Satan, spoke out against me insulting words, which are written down in the miscellanies of Eliphaz. Chapter 42 and after Elihu ended his arrogant speech, the Most High, having appeared plainly to me through a hurricane and cloud, spoke and censored Elihu, showing me that the one who spoke in him was not a human but a beast. And when the Most High spoke to me through the cloud, the four kings also heard the voice of him who spoke. After the Most High finished speaking to me, he said to Eliphaz, You there, Eliphaz, you and your two friends, why did you sin? You have not spoken truly regarding my servant Job. Arise and have him offer up sacrifices on your behalf so your sin might be taken away. Except for him, I would have destroyed you. So they brought me the things for sacrifice, and I took them and made an offering on their behalf. And the Most High received it favorably and forgave their sin. Chapter 43 then when Eliphaz, Beldad, and Sophar knew that the Most High had showed them favor regarding their sin, but had not considered Elihu worthy, Eliphaz replied and spoke up with a hymn, while the other friends and their troops sang to him in response near the altar. Eliphaz spoke in this manner. Our sins were stripped off and our lawlessness buried. Elihu, Elihu, the only evil one, will have no memorial among the living. His quenched lamp lost its luster, and the splendor of his lantern will flee from him into condemnation. For this one is the one of darkness and not of light, and the doorkeepers of darkness shall inherit his splendor and majesty. His kingdom is gone, his throne is rotted, and the honor of his tent lies in Hades. He loved the beauty of the snake and the scales of the dragon. Its venom and poison shall be his food. He did not take to himself the Most High, nor did he fear him, but even his honored ones he provoked to anger. The Most High has forgotten him, and the Holy Ones abandoned him. But wrath and anger shall be his tent. He has no hope in his heart, nor peace in his body. He had the poison of asps in his tongue. Righteous is the Most High, true in his judgments. With him there is no favoritism. He will judge us all together. Behold, the Most High has come. Behold, his holy ones are prepared, while crowns lead the way with praises. Let the holy ones rejoice. Let them leap for joy in their hearts, for they have received the splendor they awaited. Gone is our sin, cleansed is our lawlessness, and the evil one Elihu has no memorial among the living. Chapter 44 And Eliphaz ended the hymn, while all were singing in response to him and encircling the altar, we arose and entered the city, where we now make our home. And we held great festivities in the delight of the Most High. Once again I sought to do good works for the poor, and all my friends and those who had known me as a benefactor came to me, and they queried me, saying, What do you ask of us now? And remembering the poor again to do them good, I asked them, saying, Let each one give me a lamb for the clothing of the poor who are naked. So then every single one brought a lamb and a gold coin, and the Most High blessed all the goods I owned, and he doubled my estate. Chapter 45 and now, my children, behold, I am dying. Above all, do not forget the Most High. Do good to the poor. Do not overlook the helpless. Do not take to yourselves wives from strangers. Look, my children, I am dividing among you everything that is mine, so each one may have unrestricted control over his own share. 
chapter 46. And they brought forth the estate for distribution among the seven males only, for he did not present any of the goods to the females. They were grieved and said to their father, Our father, sir, are we not also your children? Why then did you not give us some of your goods? But Job said to the females, Do not be troubled, my daughters. I have not forgotten you. I have already designated for you an inheritance better than that of your seven brothers. Then when he had called his daughter, who was named Hamera, he said to her, Take the signet ring, go to the vault, and bring the three golden boxes, so that I may give you your inheritance. So she left and brought them back. And he opened them and brought out three multicolored cords, whose appearance was such that no man could describe, since they were not from earth but from heaven, shimmering with fiery sparks like the rays of the sun. And he gave each one a cord, saying, Place these about your breasts, so it may go well with you all the days of your life. Chapter 47 Then the other daughter, named Cassia, said to him, Father, is this the inheritance which you said was better than that of our brothers? Who has any use for these unusual cords? We cannot gain a living from them, can we? And their father said to them, Not only shall you gain a living from these, but these cords will lead you into the better world to live in the heavens. Are you then ignorant, my children, of the value of these things? The Most High considered me worthy of these in the day in which he wished to show me mercy and to rid my body of the plagues and the worms. Calling me, he furnished me with these three cords and said, Arise, gird your loins like a man, I shall question you, and you answer me. So I took them and put them on, and immediately from that time the worms disappeared from my body, and the plagues too. And then my body got strength through the Most High as if I actually had not suffered a thing. I also forgot the pains in my heart, and the Most High spoke to me in power, showing me things present and things to come. Now then, my children, since you have these objects, you will not have to face the enemy at all. But neither will you have worries of him in your mind. Since it is a protective amulet of the Father, rise then, gird yourselves with them before I die, in order that you may be able to see those who are coming from my soul, in order that you may marvel over the creatures of the Most High. Chapter 48 Thus when the one called Himera arose, she wrapped around her own string, just as her father said, and she took on another heart, no longer minded, toward earthly things, but she spoke ecstatically in the angelic dialect, sending up a hymn to the Most High, in accord with the hymnic style of the angels, and as she spoke ecstatically, she allowed the Spirit to be inscribed on her garment. Chapter 49 then Cassia bound hers on and had her heart changed so that she no longer regarded worldly things, and her mouth took on the dialect of the archons, and she praised the Most High for the creation of the heights. So if anyone wishes to know the creation of the heavens, he will be able to find it in the hymns of Cassia. Chapter 50 Then the other one also named Amalthea's horn bound on her cord, and her mouth spoke ecstatically in the dialect of those on high, since her heart also was changed, keeping aloof from worldly things. For she spoke in the dialect of the cherubim, glorifying the master of virtues, by exhibiting their splendor. And finally, whoever wishes to grasp a trace of the paternal splendor will find it written down in the prayers of Amalthea's horn. Chapter 51 After the three had stopped singing hymns while the Most High was present, as was I, Nereus, the brother of Job, and while the holy angel also was present, I sat near Job on the couch, and I heard the magnificent things while each one made explanation to the other, and I wrote out a complete book of most of the contents of hymns that issued from the three daughters of my brother so that these things would be preserved, for these are the magnificent things of the Most High. 
Chapter 52 After three days, as Job fell ill on his bed, without suffering or pain, however, since suffering could no longer touch him on account of the omen of the sash he wore, after those three days he saw those who had come for his soul, and rising immediately he took a lyre and gave it to his daughter Himera. To Cassia he gave a censer, and to Almethea's horn he gave a kettle drum, so that they might bless those who had come for his soul. And when they took them, they saw the gleaming chariots which had come for his soul, and they blessed and glorified the Most High, each one in her own distinctive dialect. After these things, the one who sat in the great chariot got off and greeted Job, as the three daughters and their father himself looked on though certain others did not see. And taking the soul, he flew up, embracing it, and mounted the chariot and set off for the east. But his body, prepared for burial, was borne to the tomb, as his three daughters went ahead, girded about, and singing hymns to the Most High. Chapter 53 And I, Nereus, his brother, with the seven male children, accompanied by the poor and the orphans, and all the helpless, we were weeping and saying, Woe to us today, a double woe. Gone today is the strength of the helpless. Gone is the light of the blind. Gone is the father of the orphans. Gone is the host of the strangers. Gone is the clothing of widows. Who then will not weep over the man of the Most High? And as soon as they brought the body to the tomb, all the widows and orphans circled about, forbidding it to be brought into the tomb. But after three days they laid him in the tomb in a beautiful sleep, since he received a name renowned in all generations forever. Amen.